Hello all, welcome back to the channel. In this episode, I'm gonna wheel you back into the social strata and walk you through character creation for Vampire the Masquerade live action play. Today, let's take a quick look at the classic Mind's Eye Theater edition, Laws of the Night, and create a simple character that's ready for play in most games. To make this character, roll 2d10, but not really. Leave your dice at home, neonates, cause today we're throwing chops. Like everything else in gaming, LARP is divisive. Some swear by it and take it very seriously, while some simply can't wrap their minds around it. Or maybe you totally get the appeal of LARP, but you've had a bad experience in the past. Be it player gatekeeping, a lazy head ST who didn't explain the rules or character creation, or some other issue that raised the barrier to entry. Well, I certainly can't take away bad experiences that you may have had, but I can try my best to lend a hand to folks who are curious about giving LARP a try for the first time or getting back into it after a long absence. If you've watched any of my other tutorial videos, I always like to make up the concept of my character first. This video is going to follow that tradition. While there's no right or wrong way to make a character, this process has served me well in my gaming journey. Your character concept can come from anywhere. Perhaps you have a favorite film, book, or graphic novel you really enjoy. Or maybe you have an idea for a person in your head that is completely unique. There's really no right or wrong answer about who your character can be. I recently played a character in a tabletop game written for me for a single game event. I really enjoyed the character, so I'm going to try to recreate him for a LARP. Granted, the character was made for a different edition of the game, but the concept will be the same. James Kaplinski lived in Chicago all his life, a Catholic boy from a working class family on the South Side who made good. When he showed his folks the acceptance letter to Notre Dame Law School, he thought they might die from pride. His dad was a little disappointed that James wouldn't be following in his footsteps by joining the Chicago PD, but he got over it pretty quickly once he saw that acceptance package included a full ride scholarship. That's my boy, Jimmy the Genius his father said. Plagued by imposter syndrome, the rigors of law school wreaked havoc on James's mental health. Somehow, he managed to make it through with only one major meltdown, which he masterfully hid from his family. After graduation, James moved back to the city where he practiced contract law for a large corporation in the Loop. It was a good gig that paid more money than he knew what to do with, but after a few years, James was burned out and unfulfilled. To combat that nagging, empty feeling, James started doing criminal cases pro bono on the south and west sides of the city. The added work brought some relief, filling up the quiet moments at night when he would otherwise be alone with his thoughts. When a colleague approached James about a teaching position at UIC's School of Law, he jumped at the opportunity. Academia would bring new challenges, he thought. Maybe this would finally be what filled the void. And it almost was. Almost. Shortly after starting his professorship, James's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was dead by spring, and his dad followed a few months later with a heart attack. And then, his little brother Tommy flipped his patrol car during a high-speed chase on the Kennedy, leaving him paralyzed from the chest down. All the years of anxiety and depression felt like a harbinger for the rapid-fire tragedy of that horrible year. It was more than James's already taxed psyche could handle. James tried religion psychic hotlines, and even went to a shrink. But nothing soothed the hopelessness and grief. The night Tommy died from a lung infection, James sat in the hospital chapel, asking God for a message. But the only thing he felt was his brother's service revolver in his coat pocket. One short Uber ride later, and James was standing on a secluded beach, gazing up at the stars, shining over Lake Michigan. He lost himself in those stars and the silence of his mind. James Kaplinski lifted the gun to his chin, and the world faded to black. Talk about a botched suicide. James never even got the chance to pull the trigger. His sire had been observing James for weeks, watching from the pews as he came and went from confession and casting side-eyed glances at evening mass as he genuflected in the aisle. She could smell the death rolling off him that last night and couldn't bear to witness one of God's chosen taking his own life. It wasn't a bullet that hit James in the head, but a chunk of concrete she'd picked up from the beach. In an effort to save him, his very soul she whacked him across the base of the skull. Only one problem, though. The strike was a little 
too effective. Panicked and guilt-ridden, Andrea embraced James then and there. Now, James, who was written with me in mind by another storyteller, was embraced in Malkavian. However, I could make this concept, which I'm calling the Forlorn Truth Seeker, work with plenty of other clans, like Bruja or Ventru, with just a little retooling. Remember, think of the reasons why the character Sire embraced them, and less about how to fit the character into a specific clan mold. But for now, to keep things simple, I'm going to build James for LARP as a Malkavian. If you're familiar with my earlier edition vampire videos, you'll remember archetypes from the V20 character creation. Nature is who your character is on the inside, her true motivations, the core of who she is. Archetypes can be found on page 73. For James, based on my interpretation of his background, I'll assign his nature as child. Now, many players might interpret this archetype as literally being childlike. For James, who was mostly a functional adult, that's not how I'm interpreting it. James's nature reflects the character's emotional maturity. Without a strong support system, James has difficulty finding fulfillment and happiness. For his demeanor, or what James expresses to the outside world, I'll assign Judge. James was raised in a family of police, and he went to law school to become a lawyer. Even if he often questions the values he was raised with, he faces the world draped in idealism. Next, the Laws of the Night instructs us to decide on a path of morality for our character. I'll save us a lot of confusion and break this down in simple, applicable terms. Unless you're playing in a Sabbat game, you'll most likely be using humanity for your character. That's not to say that alternate paths of enlightenment are out of the question for your non sabbat characters. After all, every game and storyteller are different. But for this video, we will focus on humanity exclusively. If you're a new player to this game, this is going to save a lot of confusion, I assure you. We'll talk more about morality later in this tutorial. It's time to proceed to step two. Attributes represent the physical, social, and mental capabilities of the character. The attributes you put on your sheet represent the innate qualities of your character. If you've played any version of the tabletop game, this section is going to be distinctly different, but familiar. First, you'll prioritize your character's attributes, assigning seven to your character's primary, five to the secondary, and three to the tertiary. For example, James is most skilled mentally. He's been a lawyer and a professor, so this is an easy pick. I'll assign him seven mental traits. Next, James is more socially adept than he is physically capable with the law and the teaching, so I'll give him five social traits and three physical traits. Attributes are listed as a series of adjectives which describe your character's capabilities. In game terms, these attributes are used or bid when you enter a situation without a foregone conclusion. As an example, if your character wanted to push someone over, you might indicate that they were brawny enough to do so, brawny being a strength-related trait. You always want to bid traits appropriate for the particular challenge. Think of how these adjectives describe your character when picking them. If you're playing a muscle-bound bodybuilder who speaks in monosyllabic grunts, charming may not make sense for that. More on challenges later. To describe James's mental acumen, I'll assign him the following mental traits. Attentive, dedicated, insightful, knowledgeable, observant, patient, and reflective. Next, we'll assign the social traits, which for James are charming, commanding, friendly, persuasive, and witty. Physical traits I'll assign to reflect strength, dexterity, and stamina with wiry, dexterous, and enduring, respectively. When you assign these traits, you do want to contemplate how they relate to your abilities, disciplines, and common activities of your character. I like to go from a pure story angle, but you might prefer a more strategic character creation style. That's a totally acceptable way to make a character. After all, we're here to play a game. Just be cautious of falling into the trap of making a one-dimensional character that's only purpose is combat. Vampire the Masquerade and other World of Darkness games are much more rewarding storytelling games than they are adventure or combat games. Cool, let's move along to abilities. Laws of the Night gives you five abilities to assign to represent your character's training and expertise. Five abilities? Are you kidding me? In tabletop, I get so many more. Yeah, Professor, you do. But this isn't tabletop, so how about we stick with this game instead of confusing new players with your unwavering biases? I hate you. 
Like your attributes, you can take abilities multiple times to represent a greater degree of focus. For the purpose of this video, ability scores can range from 1 to 5. A score of 1 indicates competence, able to earn a living with the ability, while a score of 5 is considered a master, doctorate, or true innovator. For Mind's Eye Theater, I make it a point to remember these abilities do not represent everything my character can do, simply everything my character is particularly skilled at. There is an option for ability specialization available, but I'm not going to spend time on it for this video. If specialization is something you're interested in, make sure you chat with your storyteller first to make sure it's being used in their chronicle. For James, I picked abilities to reflect his education and career. First, academics, which reflect his college education. Next, empathy. I think James would be talented at reading the emotional state of his clients, judges, or jury members. Next, etiquette, representing his law school experience and understanding of the subtleties of courtroom behavior. Expression, because, I mean, you have to be able to say what you want if you're going to be successful at litigation or teaching. And finally, law, because, obviously. There are definitely other abilities I want to give James. Luckily, I'll have a chance to flesh out the character a little bit more at the end. If you're following along in the book, our next step is to pick disciplines. However, I'm going to deviate from this and get into disciplines later. Let's finish some more mundane aspects of James before we get into the specifically supernatural stuff. Let's take a look at backgrounds next. Backgrounds represent your character's ties to the world around them, both mundane and supernatural. Backgrounds start on page 93. For veterans of World of Darkness games, many backgrounds will be familiar to you. One major exception is influence. Influences are split into various areas of manipulation in human society. Influence in LARP can be overwhelming, complex, and intimidating. In fact, for some players, it can be a whole additional game on top of your regular gaming sessions. Word of caution. Vampires in the whole don't exert control over anything. Those that try will find out quickly that people don't want to be controlled and will revolt, often violently. Remember that when you try to use your influence in your game. Your kindred might have the right blackmail material, might know the gang leader's number two, or might be bankrolling the art critic studio, and thus her ability to push and pull these organizations from the shadows. The moment your vampire steps from the darkness to crush the police commissioner's will with an iron gauntlet, everything changes. Kindred Existence is a subtle game of three-dimensional chess, not a game of whack-a-mole at the amusement park. Kindred have remained hidden for centuries because of their ability to influence mortal institutions, not because they ruled over them. Thanks, Professor. That was a shockingly cogent and helpful interlude from you. Are you sick? All right, backgrounds. James was able to make a few contacts in the city during his time as a public defender. If he needs to track down some info in the city, he can usually find a couple folks willing to help him out. I'll give him contacts of two representing these folks. While James isn't currently practicing law, after all, it's pretty hard to be in front of a judge at 8 a.m. when the sun will ignite you like tinder, he still knows a few folks in the system. I'll give him an influence in legal of two. While he was alive, James Kaplinski made his mortgage and his car payments early every month with plenty of money left over. But now that he's embraced, his options for white collar employment are rather narrow. So, to make ends meet, he teaches night classes at the local community college and tutors pre-law students for the LSAT. This earns him just enough money to pay the bills and keep a roof over his head. Let's give him a resources of one to represent that. Next, let's get into disciplines. Each clan has three in-clan disciplines or vampiric powers intrinsically linked to their blood heritage. In most circumstances, a Malkavian who embraces another person will pass on the same predilections and characteristics to their child. James has access to Auspex, Dementation, and Obfuscate. At this time, you'll pick three basic disciplines for your character. Discipline levels must be taken in order, meaning you must take the first level basic before you can take the second level basic. For example, before I can take Auspex Aura Perception, I've got to take Auspex Heightened Senses. I will assign James Auspex Heightened Senses, an Obfuscate, Cloak of Shadows, and Unseen Presence. I think James would be more apt to hide and move through places unseen, especially for the purposes of hunting, and less likely to drive people to madness using dementation. 
Okay, it's time to get down to the minutia and the final steps of character creation. Last touches start on 106, but for a full breakdown of what this entails, turn to page 68 of your book. First, let's address James's clan. When you decide on your character's clan, a number of advantages and disadvantages come along with it. Malkavians receive one free level of awareness ability to represent their insights into the world of the unseen. Mark this ability on your sheet, be it blessing or curse. The Malkavians are able to see patterns and secrets that others are unable to discern. Additionally, the Malkavian clan are able to sense each other. This is represented by access to the so-called, and possibly offensive, Madness Network, an invisible connection that all Malkavians share. This madness infects all Malkavians in the form of a derangement. This terrible and terrifying madness strikes the clan to their core. They aren't funny or comical, they are terrifying cracks in the mental tapestry of the kindred beyond the scope of human comprehension, and they should be handled with maturity. For a list of derangements and full descriptions, check out page 212. James's embrace had a major impact on his mental state. While he's still racked by occasional self-loathing and anxiety, a terrible guilt from feeding on mortals has risen within him. When he takes the lifeblood of his victims, he also believes he takes some part of their soul as well. This manifests in the form of hallucinations and voices in his head, chastising him and urging him to ruin. Sadly, his sire is unequipped or unwilling to help him with his affliction. Not that it would matter in the end, as no Malkavian can ever truly be free from their derangement. Next, I'll assign James blood and willpower. Blood and willpower serve several functions for your character, which we don't have time to dive into during this video. Full details on these are listed on page 106 and 107. James is 13th generation. On page 95, I consult the table to determine that his blood pool, the total vampiric blood available to the character when full, is 10, of which he can use one per turn. And his starting willpower is two, with a maximum of six. Fill in 10 dots on your sheet, or mark the number down if you're doing this on scrap paper, under blood, and two dots under willpower. Let's talk about morality next. I don't wanna underemphasize how important I feel morality is to the game of Vampire the Masquerade and games that take place in the world of darkness as a whole. It's my firm belief that when we play Vampire, we aren't trying to be the darkest, most evil bastards the world has ever seen. I mean, sure, you can make that character, and that's totally fine. Personally, I believe we are creating people, normal, everyday folks, thrust into a terrible situation, who struggle to maintain a grip on their identity in the face of terrible odds. The world, the beast inside you, the other predators circling you, and inescapable loss will tear at your character's very soul and drag them down to hell. Your character can either fight against the corruption or give themselves over to it. Yes, vampirism grants great power, but every terrible act takes a significant toll on your character's psyche. This struggle is the core of your experience and morality is your guide. As I mentioned earlier, this tutorial will deal explicitly with humanity. For alternate paths of morality, talk to your storyteller or just pester me to make another video. You have three virtues listed. They are conscience slash conviction, self-control slash instinct, and courage. Take your pen and cross out conviction and instinct. Vampires who maintain their humane ideals follow conscience and self-control. For each of these virtues, again, for humanity, you start with one free dot in each. Next, you'll have seven dots to distribute between the three, representing your character's connection to the individual virtue. Each virtue ranges from zero to five. Zero is bad don't end up there. Whenever you violate your morality at a level at or below your trait level, you make a conscience virtue test. For instance, if your character has a humanity of three and has a selfish thought, a violation for humanity five, no test is required. This is simply beneath your character's notice. But if your character accidentally kills a victim during feeding, a test is in order. Work with your storyteller closely when addressing these situations. Conscience represents your connection to feelings of shame and remorse. The higher your conscience, the more you suffer when you do something immoral. For James, I'll assign him two more dots for a total of three. Self-control represents your character's ability to hold back those bouts of murderous rage the beast makes them prone to. Vampires, uh, frenzy. The beast wants to indulge in those base desires like eating, killing, and punishing insults. 
Depending on the source, Frenzy can be somewhat easy to avoid or downright overwhelming. James gets three total. Courage doesn't necessarily indicate how much courage your character possesses from an ego perspective, but how well your beast is able to resist the terror of vampiric banes of fire, sunlight, and true faith. For James, I'll add three more dots to give him four. To determine James's starting humanity, I'll figure out the average of his conscience and self-control rounded up. For James, that's three. If we look at page 76, we can get a gauge on James's overall outlook on the world. Sadly, James has started to become a bit jaded about the people around him. People die, stuff breaks. While he's not a full-on monster of the night, he's become a bit more comfortable with that monstrous aspect of himself. Okay, folks, let's sprint for the finish line, shall we? The last important step is earning and spending free traits to round out your character. First, you can take negative traits in physical, social, and mental to represent shortcomings of your character. For instance, James is clumsy, so I'll mark that down giving me one additional point to spend in a second. Be aware, your negative traits should be roleplayed accordingly. Those you interact with can use them against you and should be expected to reasonably guess those traits based on your roleplay. You may take up to five total negative traits with no more than three total per category. The arrangements may be taken for your character as well, which equals two free traits at character creation. This doesn't include the mandatory derangement for Malkavians. You don't get any points for that. I'm good with the one I've taken for James' care of his clan, so I'm gonna skip this. Flaws represent additional shortcomings of your character, rating from one trait to seven. The higher the flaw, the more debilitating, but the greater the reward. For merits and flaws, it's a good idea to consult with your storyteller first. Many games and orgs have specific house rules governing them. The rules, as stated, allow you to sign up to seven points total in flaws, each one conferring one point in return. You may purchase up to seven points in merits using free points at one for one cost. Neither of these are required for character creation. I'll skip them here and let you dig into this on your own. You may also sacrifice one point in your morality, bringing your character a little closer to their beast in the process for another two traits. I'm not about that life for James, but feel free if it makes sense for your character. Finally, everyone gets five free traits to spend as they like to improve their character. I have a total of six points to spend improving James based on my build. Costs are as follows. Quickly, I'll give James an extra physical trait, tough, to represent his upbringing with two brothers and a cop for a dad. I'll give him the following abilities to represent his life a bit clearer. Investigation firearms, and streetwise, each representing either his upbringing or his work after college. I'll give him an extra dot in resources. James has a modest house and a modest car on the northwest side of the city, and one dot in influence police representing his familial and former legal connections. In a pinch, he could fit in at the local police pub and get the lowdown on recent management and policy changes. Sweet. That's about it for James and our character creation tutorial. It's just the beginning of our fun and potential. Before you start playing, think about the motivations, secrets, appearance, and quirks of your character. One of the most fun aspects of LARP, to me, is being able to bring that character to life. Think about a unique item, an article of clothing, or a saying your character uses. Maybe James has a lucky coin or a pin he got from his dad that he wears on his coat. The sky's the limit, so be creative. I've also used two different methods for character creation the old school pen and paper style, as well as a program called Grapevine. This app is quite a bit old, but it's free and fairly easy to navigate. It's a little hard to find, so I've included a link to this and everything else I've used in the description below if you want to use it. Also, one last piece of advice for beginners of this game. Be prepared to make changes to your character after you present it to the storyteller for approval. While the rules in the book will get you to the game, nearly every storyteller, chronicle, or troop has customized the rules to fit their particular situation. Large organizations and regional communities might have loads of additional content to use or offer additional points to build your character, or they might restrict certain disciplines or merits based on any number of reasons. Try not to let this upset you, and also try to be flexible when working with your storyteller or game group. Remember, points don't make your character come to life, roleplay does. Thanks for watching. 
I hope this video has been helpful. If you'd like to see similar videos, let me know in the comments below. Pick up a copy of Laws of the Night by following my link in the description below and help my show. Back me on Patreon, follow me on all the socials, and I'll see you next time. Oh, thank you, oh, thank you. I'm a professor of power gamer, and I'm very hot and very sweaty. Too hot for TV.